Today on Answers with Bayless Conley. Do you know what? I think we're going to be shocked when we step into heaven and see the glories of the world to come and how good those that have gone before us have actually had it. Underneath the frumpy garments of inconsistency and hypocrisy and pretense that some people have dressed the gospel in, there is still a beautiful, powerful, glorious Savior. And you need to put your eyes on Him. There are many questions you are faced with every day. We are all searching for answers that will make a real difference in our lives. It's hard to imagine that these answers might be right in front of us. Get ready to discover answers in the Bible with Bayless Conley. Hello, friend. I'm Bayless Conley. I want to welcome you to the broadcast today. We're going to be dealing with a subject that is applicable to everyone. We're going to be talking a little bit about death and how do we cope with the loss of a loved one. Now, I know a little bit about that. Um, just in the last year, I've lost both of my parents lost a number of friends uh, throughout the years, one just, just a few days ago. And the truth is there are answers in the Bible. I have found my comfort there and I wanna bring that comfort to you. Here's Bayless Conley with part two of his continuing message from last week. We've recently lost both of my parents. My dad died seven months ago. My mother died last Sunday, a week ago, today. Uh, there's certainly an ache in my heart and the ache of our family's hearts at the loss, but the loss was not theirs. The loss is on this side. They have gained. To depart and be with Christ is far better. It's far better. You know, the old building, Sausalito Street, there was only two windows in the building. My office had one of them. It was actually more originally slated, but we um, had to do some value engineering at the end in order to get the building erected and, and windows were expensive and so we took most of them out, but I, I kept mine. And um, when I'd sit at my desk and look out the window, this was my view, telephone poles and traffic. It's, that's all I could see. And one day I'm sitting in the office and I have a huge pile of paperwork. It's tons of emails to go through and all sorts of other stuff, decisions I have to make. And honestly, paperwork has never been my happy place. <laughs> I don't do well with papers. And um, so I'm just loathing, you know, having to dive into these papers, but know that I have to. And I look out and there's the telephone poles and the traffic and the papers and I noticed some mail has come to the office, and there's a, a postcard. I pick it up, it's from a couple in church that are vacationing in the South Seas. And they're actually staying on an island that many people re refer to as the Jewel of the South Pacific. And they write this nice little note, you know, dear pastor, we're at such and such, enjoying ourselves, you know, on the beach. And um, I look at this, this picture of this pristine, empty beach. And then I look up at the telephone poles, <laughs> the traffic, and I look down at this huge pile of papers and emails, and I look back at the postcard, and I look back at the telephone poles, and I couldn't stop thinking about this postcard. Those poor people. <laughs> Man, sitting on a pristine beach with white sand, gentle ocean breezes, you know, caressing them, not a care in the world. Poor, poor people. <laughs> no, I actually, I thought, I wish I was experiencing what they're experiencing. I wish I could see what they're seeing. I wish I could feel what they're, fe you know, what they're feeling. And the truth is, you know, heaven is far better than the most pristine beach you could ever imagine. And I'd like to see what they're seeing and feel what they're fe fe feeling and hear what they're hearing. To depart and be with Christ is not a little better. It is far better. Now, we need not grieve for loved ones that have died in the Lord. They have gained. 
We shouldn't shed tears for them. And I've shared this story before. A friend of mine, we were 17, he got a job on the Queen Mary. And um, he and I and another friend one day, we uh, went exploring. Now, he'd been to a few naughty places on the boat, so he took us to all the naughty places you're not supposed to go. We climbed up in the smokestacks and down into the guts of the ship and, you know, any door that would open, we went through it and uh, having, you know, a great time. And then we're in, I don't know, we're somewhere in the middle of the ship and my friend talks me into getting on a service elevator. So I do, and I thought he's going to get on with me, but he slams the gate shut, hits the button, and I start to go down, and I'm listening to him cackle with laughter as I'm descending. It actually ends up in the kitchen of the Sir Winston Churchill. Now, at that time, it was the fanciest restaurant on the boat. And I get down there, and I can't get the elevator to go back up. So I thought, oh, well, I'm going to face the music. And I walk out into the kitchen, and the head chef walks over. Now, I mean, it's, it's filled with people with suits and ties and dresses and pearl necklaces, and they're enjoying their afternoon steaks and martinis. And the head chef, he, he doesn't say, what are you doing here? He doesn't ask me who I am. He looks at me and says, are you hungry? I said, well, a little bit. <laughs> he sets up a chef's table for me in the middle of the kitchen, serves me an amazing lunch, says, you want some salad? I said, yeah, it gives me salad. <laughs> and then brings this beautiful tray of desserts. Says, you want a dessert? I said, yeah. <laughs> I ate a dessert. He says, you want another one? I said, yeah. I'm in there like a half an hour being treated like a dignitary. I'm feasting. And meanwhile, my friends are waiting. They're thinking, I've got it really bad. <laughs> you know, maybe they've taken me into holding or something. And I eventually walk out of the restaurant, and they're shocked when they find out how good I had it. <laughs> but you know what? I think we're going to be shocked when we step into heaven and see the glories of the world to come and how good those that have gone before us have actually had it. No, we shouldn't be shedding tears for them. Now it says to depart and to be with Christ. Where is Jesus? Is he in purgatory? Is he in limbo? Is he just dead in the grave where he ceased to exist? Is he in some soul sleep where he has no consciousness? No, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. And my friend, that is where we go when we depart this life. The book of James says that death occurs when the spirit leaves the body. You are a spirit being. Amen. You have a soul and you live in a physical body. That's the house that you live in. Death is when the real you, the spirit being, departs from your body. And at death, you'll either go up or you'll go down. You don't hang around to ha haunt somebody's apartment or haunt somebody's house. You go one or two directions. I remember hearing this story. This lady was married to this miserly, mean guy. And he spent money on himself pretty freely, but never spent a dime on her. But she toughed it out and, you know, stayed in the marriage. And eventually he took sick and was on his deathbed. And he calls his wife and says, wife, come in here. He says, I'm going to die soon. I want you to look under the bed. She goes under the bed. There's a big suitcase under there. She pulls it out, puts it on into the bed. He said, open it. She opens it. It's filled with cash. It looks like a few hundred thousand dollars. And she said, honey, you, you, you've saved this to provide for me after you're gone. He says, no, that's not for you. That's mine. <laughs> he said, now they say you can't take it with you when you go, but I don't believe that. I want you to put it up in the attic. And when I go, when I leave my body, I'm going to grab it on the way by. <laughs> he said, promise me. She said, all right, I'll put it where you can grab it on the way by. A <laughs> couple days later, he's not passed yet. Some of her friends have come over. They're having some tea. And sort of with hushed tones, 
she tells them the story and they go, what? He had all that money and he's, he's, he's expecting to take it? She said, yeah. They said, well, what'd you do with it? She said, I, I put it where he can get it when he goes by. They said, you're kidding. You put it up in the attic? She said, no, I put it down in the cellar. <laughs> Is he not going up? <laughs> He's going the other way. But you know, as believers, we go up. Amen. Now, Paul was eventually released from this Roman imprisonment. But you might say, well, what, wasn't his head cut off later on? Well, according to tradition, Yes, it was, but let me show you something. Look at me at 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy was written by Paul approximately seven years after the book of Philippians was penned. So this is seven years into the future. A lot has happened over this period of time. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, he writes, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. That word departure is the same Greek word we read in, in Philippians chapter 1 where I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ. He's saying, look, I'm ready to pull up anchor and set sail for heaven. I'm ready to pull up my tent stakes and move out of this tent and move into my mansion in the glory world. Verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Paul said, I finished. I've kept the faith. I'm ready to stand before him and receive my reward. And frankly, when you're done, what does it matter if they cut your head off or if God just takes your breath away? I mean, you read the book of Revelation, martyrs have a very special place in heaven anyway. If your time's up, that's maybe not a bad way to go. But the point is this. Paul didn't go until God was done with him in this life. He went as a tree filled with fruit, as a runner that had finished his race. And I want to ask you, do you have an assurance which way you'd go? if you stepped out of your body today, and I don't mean to scare anyone, but I think we all realize that life is pretty fragile. The book of James says that this earthly life is like a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. And one day, listen, every person listening to my voice right now, whether in this building or online or through some other medium, you will one day step out of your body and step into eternity. Have you sorted out where you're going to go? That is the most important question that you need to have answered in this life is where you're going to go. And then, you know, I think it's important that God be glorified in our death when it is time for us to die, as Paul said. But I think we also need to imbibe the spirit that says, I want him to be glorified by my living as well by my lifestyle, by my character, by my attitudes. And the next verse, Paul says this, only in verse 27 of Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1 and 27, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fa fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Whether I come or not, live right. Live as believers. In fact, this phrase that he uses in this verse, he said, let your conduct be. It literally means in the Greek language to live as a citizen. Live as a citizen. He uses the same metaphor in chapter 3 and verse 20, where he says, for our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our lifestyle should reflect the fact that Jesus is our King and that heaven is our homeland. Amen. How we live should reflect well on the gospel. You know, Paul writes 
in the book of Titus in the second chapter to believers about the kind of attitudes and character they should display, especially out in the workplace, that they should be loyal, that we should be loyal, that we should be trustworthy, that we should have a good attitude and be faithful. And he specifically says, and don't steal items of small value that you may adorn the gospel of Christ. He's talking about in the workplace where we're rubbing shoulders with, with everybody out there. Don't steal your employer's time. Don't steal the stapler. Keep a good attitude. Be faithful. Watch what you say. Now, he says, for this reason, that we may adorn, literally dress the gospel. And I, I think that we can dress the gospel in a very appealing way. The gospel is glorious. But sometimes people dress it up in clothes that other folks can't quite get through. It says, adorn this glorious gospel the right way. And I was doing meetings in Europe many years ago and was flying home from Frankfurt to LA and got on the plane and the seat next to me was empty. They're about to close the door. I'm thinking, okay, you know, I'm going to have 10 hours of, of peace on the flight back. And just before they close the door, this woman comes on and she's sitting next to me. So I have to get up, let her through. And she was a sight. She had this big frumpy, baggy track suit on. She had this floppy, weird, giant hat on. Weird pair of big, giant glasses. She had a giant ball of yarn and two knitting needles and a big, huge bag with her. And she sort of shuffled on. It's got this ball of yarn, knitting needles, frumpy everything. And I just thought, this is going to be an interesting flight. So I get out of the way. She sits down next to me. I say, hi. And I, I fell asleep before the plane took off. I was sleeping for a couple hours. And I, I woke up. And I looked next to me. And the frumpy lady was gone. And there was a gorgeous woman sitting there. She was literally, she was stunning. And it actually wasn't a different woman. It was the same woman. She lost the floppy hat, got rid of the funky glasses, took off the big baggy jacket she had on, you know, stuck the ball of yarn under the seat. And I started talking to her. Turns out she'd been a model in Italy and she was Germany's number one actress at the time. And she dressed up like that to get through the airport so the paparazzi wouldn't harass her. And she's, I started talking to her. She's really intelligent. She speaks four languages. And for about the next six or seven hours, we talked about Jesus on the flight. And I've thought a lot about that. That's kind of what Paul is saying not to do with the gospel. You know, we, we, we have a sour attitude or we're inconsistent or hypocritical in our lifestyle. Listen, the gospel is still true. It's still glorious, but we adorn it with the wrong kind of clothes. And it's hard for some people to get through that. You are the only Bible some people will ever, ever read. I'm the only Bible some people will ever read. I was golfing with a guy one day. We started talking about Jesus. And he, he said, look, Bayless, he said, I'll just be, be candid with you. You know, I've, in, in my business, I've worked with a lot of Christians. And there's been a lot of inconsistency with them. They've made promises they didn't keep. And, you know, honestly, there, I've just seen hypocrisy and it's really put me off. And I said, you know, I'm sorry about that. And I said, you know, I don't like it either. I said, it really bugs me, you know, when I see that. But listen, underneath the frumpy garments of inconsistency and hypocrisy and pretense that some people have dressed the gospel in, there is still a beautiful, powerful, glorious Savior. And you need to put your eyes on him. And I want to tell you today, there is a glorious, wonderful Savior that gave up his life for you. And maybe you've been put off by somebody's inconsistencies or hypocrisy. Sorry about that. It's probably not the last time it's going to happen to you. But if you'll put your eyes on Jesus, you'll never want to take them off of him. He is amazing. And he stands before you today with arms open wide. He shed his precious blood, literally died on the cross 
for sins that you committed, that I committed. It was the innocent dying for the guilty. He took our place and literally paid the penalty for the sin of the world. And he died under the weight of those sins. And the claims of God's eternal justice were forever satisfied. On the third day, Christ was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says, if you believe that, and if you confess him as Lord, God brings you into a relationship called salvation. You know, it's so simple, some people stumble over the simplicity of it. It's like, well, no, I've got to do something. You know, I mean, I, I've, I have to live a good life and I have to do good works. No, it's, it's not of works. It's by grace through faith so that no one can boast. Let's just imagine that you've got this 100-yard chasm that you have to cross. God and the kingdom are on one side, you're on the other, and Jesus has actually given you this unbreakable cable that you can use to cross this 100-yard chasm. But you think, well, no, you know, I've, I've got this thread which represents your good works, your noble intentions. I think I'm going to try and put my thread across there and cross on my thread. Well, you wouldn't do that. But some people say, well, yeah, but, you know, maybe we go 50-50. We'll do 50 yards unbreakable cable, and I just, I need to add something to this. I'm going to do 50 yards of thread. No, you wouldn't do that. Well, how about 75 yards of cable and 25 yards of thread? What about 99 yards, 35 inches of unbreakable salvation cable and one inch of thread? Would you trust it? No, you wouldn't. We trust in Christ alone, Amen. not in our good works, not in our track record, not in our religious rituals. We trust in Jesus alone. Friend, he does love you. Now, if I can talk you into being saved, somebody can come along after me and talk you out of it. But if you have a sense right now that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, if you'll respond to that, no one can ever take that away from you. If it helps you just for a moment, bow your heads, close your eyes if you would. I want to lead you in a simple prayer. A prayer to embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior a prayer where we'll put our trust in him to bring us to heaven when that time comes that we exhale our last breath and step out of our bodies. It's a salvation that is so glorious, it impacts us and takes us into eternity. I'm going to ask you in just a moment, to lift a hand if you want to get in on the prayer. Maybe you've come with a friend, somebody that's been talking to you about Jesus. Maybe you've never, ever been to a church before today. Maybe you've watched the broadcast on television, decided to come. Maybe you just saw a crowd outside and you were out for a walk, decided to come in and see what the heck was happening. Whatever brought you here today, I believe that behind the scenes, there's a God of love who's drawn you here through whatever means that happened. He is interested in your life and he wants you to be free from the power of sin. He wants you to have a confidence that your eternity is set and secure. And I'm going to count to three and if you want to get in on the prayer, I'm going to acknowledge any hands that are raised then you can put them down and then I'm going to lead the whole congregation in a simple prayer. Maybe you're here this morning and you're thinking, you know, I'm just not sure. I don't, I don't know if, if I expelled that final breath and if I slipped out of my body and stepped into eternity, I'm not sure which direction I'd go. Well, friend, you need to make sure. And you can know. John wrote in one of his epistles, we know that we have eternal life by his spirit that he's given to us. So if you're unsure, or if you're a prodigal that's away from God, it's time to come home. Or if you've maybe never made a decision like this and you're ready to do it, I'm going to ask you to lift that hand. One, two, three.
Uplifted hand. I want in on the prayer when everybody prays. See hand there, another one there. God bless you. Thank you. Other hand, just put them up for a moment. There, there, and there. Thank you. There. Wonderful. There, 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 and there. God bless you. Another one back there. Thank you. Right, go ahead and put those hands down. I can't even see everybody. There's quite a few up in the upper section as well. God bless you. Listen, I can give you the words. Tie your heart around them. Speak them to God. Let's talk to God. Say, oh God, I come to you right now. With all of my heart, I put my trust in your son, Jesus. I believe he died on the cross to take away my sin. I believe that he was raised from the dead. Jesus, I invite you into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. Wash me clean. I put my trust in you alone. Amen. Awesome. Stay tuned at the end of the program today for a special inspirational thought from Bayless. Well, friend, I hope that you enjoyed the broadcast, that you got something significant out of it. And I just would like to encourage you to take a moment and share the broadcast with someone else. Get on social media, tell a friend about it. You know, we're not always ready to, to share the gospel in an articulate, relevant way, but it's pretty easy to give an invitation to someone and just say, hey, you know, I was watching this, this answer show with this Bayless guy. I really found some help. Tell somebody you never know what God might do in their life. And now here's Bayless with an inspirational thought you can apply today. Hello there. You know, one of the hallmarks of Christian life should be growth, not stagnation. God doesn't want any of us to, to remain in the same place. In fact, the truth is, if we're not going forward, we will be going backwards. The Apostle Paul said these words in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12. He said, not that I have already attained or have already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. The great apostle Paul said, look, I haven't arrived. I'm not there yet. I'm, I'm pushing on. And we ought to be growing in our life. We ought to be stretching, you know, in our lives, in our relationship with God, in our expression of the gospel toward others, and in our devotional life. I remember I read a story once about Albert Einstein, he was attending a dinner party, and a young lady at the, the party said, you know, Professor, uh, what is it that you actually do for, for a living? What, what's your, your profession? He said, well, I've devoted my life to the study of physics. And she was shocked. And she said, studying physics at your age? Well, I finished my studies a year ago. Well, friend, you don't finish in this relationship with God. We don't finish in this, this race. We're ever growing, ever going forward. So I pray as you get into God's word, as you get on your knees and pray, that you would expand, grow, and press on. Thank you for watching Answers with Bayless Conley. 